coming to this uh, in-person colloquium. It's really wonderful to have a revival of guests visiting the department and getting around and meeting people and discussing science. It's really good for me. So today we have Eli Levitz and Falk. And um, you know, no, you can't escape a colloquium visiting someone you worked with in the past without some you know, personal anecdotes. And so bear with me. I first met Eli probably back in 2008, 2009. Um, I walked into uh, to an interview for a postdoc with uh, his PhD advisor, Irfan Siddiqui, and there's Eli cranking on this old helium-3 refrigerator. He's trying to make DC measurements of weak link Josephson junctions. And, and you know, as I joined the group, I, Eli was this hardworking student, and it seems like everything that could go wrong would go wrong with the setup. Like the electronics are fried, the helium mix is spraying into the atmosphere. It was, um, you know, a, a trial of perseverance. I, I never lost mix. I almost exploded <laughs> the fridge, but I never lost it. With the, the, thing, like, the, the things were like exploded. It was pretty fun. Um, but it's always been the, the business with like, the really deep and broad knowledge. You could chat like with knowledge about almost any topic we could bring up. And you know, during time there, he invented this idea of crazy science Fridays that you should devote Friday to investigating and thinking about and working on sort of crazy science projects. And that's the spirit he takes with him today. So Eli got his PhD in 2013 and I went off over across the, the Bay to do a postdoc at Stanford with Aaron Kapaltonek, where we worked with a whole range of different uh, interesting projects ranging from things with mesoscopic systems to dark matter detection. I could try to list them all, but I won't. Um, and then uh, after some time there in 2017, he uh, joined the faculty at USC and um, started doing work uh, on superconducting circuits. So stuff similar to what we do in my lab. And um, like a good physicist, uh, you know, Eli is gonna continue to redo his PhD project um, into oblivion for his career. So actually we'll get to hear about some of that physics today as he sort of harnesses some of the most interesting stuff having to do with quasi particles, superconducting circuits. Um, in his lab. So I'm interested to hear about what he's been doing. I'll mention that Eli uh, won a very prestigious Cottrell Scholar Award, um, which is uh, rewards um, both research, but also teaching and outreach activities. And for this, he started something called Qbytes, which is like a reader's digest for quantum information papers. So the idea is um, someone does the hard work of reading the papers and writes a, like a bite-sized digest of it so he could uh, read that and um, use that to sort of stay up on the literature in a way that just reading the abstracts and title may not capture. Right. So we'll and see as that develops. You can, you can advertise it during your talks. Yes. Um, but I'll hand the floor to Eli, so we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. This is the most people I've been in a room with in almost two years. <laughs> um, before I get in, I do want to make a big plug for Qbytes. Uh, you can go to it, qbytes.org, byte like with a Y, like a bit byte, why not? Uh, this is part of the Byte Sites family of uh, websites, which are all sort of reader's digests of journal articles um, aimed at sort of a lay scientist um, audience. So for instance, in Qbytes, we assume that you have seen quantum mechanics before, but not necessarily that you know that much about quantum information science. Um, the reason I'm advertising this is not so much for readers, although I love you all to read the site, we need more authors. We need people to read articles and summarize them, and then we need people to edit those summaries. So if you are interested in this, students and postdocs, please do contact me. Uh, until the university accountants stop me from doing it, we are actually paying for this. Um, so it is a, a slightly paid uh, position. I say slightly because we don't have a ton of funding for it. Um, but uh, I find it really enjoyable. The authors we have find it really enjoyable. Um, it's great sci-com experience and it's a nice way to sort of teach yourself how to teach because it turns out that explaining these things is really hard. So, with that caveat, I will now try to explain things. <laughs> um, I need to start by just thanking the people who did 97% of the work on this, and the other 3% was done when I was a grad student. So really, it's 100% student done. Um, 
James Farmer is sort of the lead student on this project, Dr. Azan Zarasi, the uh, lead postdoc, and then Darian Evangelos and Haimong Zhang, whose name is covered up here, um, uh, helped out with device design and infrastructure. So most of you have probably heard at least a little bit of hype about superconducting quantum circuits. Um, you know, everyone shows a picture like this, this is a device from ETH Zurich uh, implementing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight qubits on a chip. Um, what these circuits do is they allow you to implement a quantum mechanical object, uh, an artificial atom, essentially, that is relatively coherent. So you put it in a quantum state, it will stay in that quantum state for appreciable length of time. It's addressable, so I can couple to it, I can talk to it, I can control it. Pretty scalable, you know, I can put a lot of these on a chip. And importantly, flexible. I can control how these things behave. Not like real atoms where, you know, every rubidium atom in the universe is identical to every other rubidium atom. If I want an artificial atom that's 10% more, you know, squishy, I can make it 10% more squishy just by slightly changing the design. So these have been used mostly for superconducting quantum bits, qubits, um, which is mostly getting all the press. We get gate-based quantum computing, um, where we do quantum operations, uh, you know, AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates, swap gates, Z gates, Hadamard gates, in order to do things like factoring large numbers. This is what you'll hear about coming out of Google and IBM. There's also quantum annealing, where you basically take a system in sort of a trivial Hamiltonian, some trivial environment. So it's in a trivial ground state. And you very, very slowly evolve the environment towards some very interesting, complicated one. If you do it slowly enough, the system will stay in its ground state the whole time. And you'll end with sort of this non-trivial ground state, but then you can then measure and learn something interesting about that. It turns out that you can map many problems onto this. That's sort of a subclass of what I'll call quantum simulation, where we're basically taking a real physical system and emulating it with our controllable quantum objects here. We're taking something that's maybe difficult to control or difficult to measure, and we're implementing a version of it on our system that's very easy to control and very easy to measure. Now, this gets all the press, but there's also um, quantum limited amplifiers. Uh, so, Kato makes a lot of these. Uh, basically, there's ways you, to use superconducting circuits to amplify small signals with adding either zero noise or at least the minimum amount of noise allowed by quantum mechanics. So this is great because you just have a really ultra low noise amplifier. You can do ultra low noise detection, but they're actually even cooler than that. They can generate what's called squeezed light, which would, where you take the electromagnetic vacuum with zero photons in it, and you put less light than there was when there was nothing. You get rid of the light along one axis of squeezing, one basically type of correlation of the electromagnetic vacuum. And you can shine this on a detector to get better sensitivity. They do this at LIGO. You can also um, get interesting light matter interactions. For instance, turns out that if you shine squeezed light on an atom, that atom will only decay along one direction. It'll only emit photons in one direction. So this is all awesome. And people have been hyping it for a while. And if you've been sort of tangentially following the field, you may be wondering why we're not in the future yet. Why we have been hearing about this stuff for years without actually seeing a lot of the results. Well, so there's challenges. The biggest one is decoherence. I said these things were fairly coherent. They're not perfectly coherent. I can set up an initial state, some wave function of time zero. And then later it will evolve to some time t. That, should, that evolution should be completely deterministic and predictable. Okay, maybe I didn't know what the state was in the beginning, but if I redo it, I should end up with the same result. I should always have the same thing. But in reality, this gets scrambled. I lose track of this. That's decoherence. What decoherence causes is a loss of fidelity of our operations. 
you know, we have a need to store information, to transfer it between different degrees of freedom, to manipulate it, and to read it out. And we want to do all of this without scrambling the information. Well, if you have decoherence, that information gets scrambled. Scalability is also an issue here. You know, it's a lot easier to make one of something or even 10 of something than it is to make a million of something. These devices are cryogenic. They live at 10 millikelvin. Turns out that getting enough cables in to your cryostat to run 10 million uh, qubits is a major engineering challenge. So more is different here. And there are still big challenges. I'm not saying they're insurmountable, but they're challenges. So the mode we're kind of in now is we do work to improve the technology. We, you know, we work on some problem. We work on the coherence. We work on some better way to do cryogenic signal routing. And we get to a point where now it's performing a lot better. Now the engineers just keep going. I'm a physicist. Kater's a physicist. Most of you here are physicists. We take this opportunity to just go and do some physics. So we do experiments that this new technology now enables. But now we discover some new limiting factors. Now we're, now we're limited by something else. And so we got to do a bunch of work to figure out how to fix it. And then we improve the technology and we iterate. And that's kind of the mode that the field has been in for a little while. It's been working really well. We are making very good progress. I've been talking about all this abstractly. Let me get into the actual basics of how this works. So. I need to introduce some building blocks. And the first is the superconducting resonant circuit. We take an inductor, which has some flux phi, and a capacitor, which has some charge Q, and you put them in parallel. You can show that the energy is quadratic in phi and quadratic in Q. It goes like phi squared and Q squared. The Hamiltonian goes like that. And that phi and Q are canonically conjugate variables. They have this commutation relation between them. So they basically have an uncertainty principle. You can't measure them both perfectly certainly at the same time. Those two properties, you know, this conjugate commutation relation and the quadratic energy, mean that you have a parabolic potential with evenly spaced energy levels. This is a quantum harmonic oscillator. This is exactly the same as a mass on a spring in quantum mechanics. Rather than the coordinate being the position or the momentum of the mass, it's the flux or the charge. This is a very nice quantum mechanical object. We can make these, they're very coherent, they're very easy to use. Uh, they have one small problem with them. They are harmonic. The energy levels are evenly spaced. And what that means is that if we want to, for instance, drive transitions between energy levels, we can't just use the energy as a way of selecting which transition we drive, because we'll drive every transition simultaneously. They're all split by H bar omega. So we need a way to break that harmonic relation. By the way, I should say, if anything I say at any point is unclear, or especially if you can't hear me, please speak up, but ask questions. Our next building block that we need is what's called a Josephson junction. This is really just a superconductor interrupted by some sort of weak link. Typically that weak link is basically a layer of insulator but sandwiched between two superconductors. So we've got like a superconductor, another superconductor, an insulator in between. Current can tunnel across the insulator with no voltage, no dissipation. It's represented by the circuit symbol here, and it's characterized by a critical current, I naught. It turns out that the current going through a junction is related to this critical current times sine delta, where delta is the phase of the superconducting order parameter across the junction. And basically, it's the phase difference of the wave function from one side to the other. So you get this sinusoidal current phase relation. This is obviously some sort of very nonlinear behavior. 
There's also uh, this relation where the voltage across the junction at DC is zero. If you're just running DC through it, you get no voltage. So there's no dissipation. But it's related to the time derivative of this phase. So you can just run through, you know, BC calculus and do the chain rule and relate voltage to the time derivative of the current instead of the time derivative of the phase. So you get the voltage is equal to this prefactor here times the time derivative of current. Well, the circuit element that has voltage proportional to time derivative of current is an inductor. So this is an inductor with this inductance. Which we can just characterize as some L naught divided by cosine delta. But I want to note here that it depends on delta. Well, so does the current. So if I change the current through this device, through this circuit element, the inductance changes. So this is a nonlinear inductor. It is not a linear device which just has an inductance. It depends on how hard you drive it. So this is where we get our nonlinear. There's one more device we need to talk about, the superconducting quantum interference device, or SQUID. This is just two junctions in a loop with a magnetic flux going through the loop. I could and probably at some point will teach a whole class about SQUIDs. For now, all we're going to say about SQUIDs is that they're going to act like a single Joseph's injunction whose critical current and inductance tunes with flux. So you see this, you get this flux tuning factor in the critical current and the inductance. And this is basically happening because when you put a flux through the squid loop, you're basically phase biasing the junctions. You're changing the DC phase through the junctions. So we've got our building blocks now. Let's stick them together. Let's just take our LC circuit, our inductor capacitor circuit, and replace the inductor with the Joseph's injunction. Could be a squid, I'll just draw it as a single junction for now. Well, I can now plot again the potential energy. This is what we had for a linear inductor. It was a parabola, so it was going to act like a harmonic oscillator. A Joseph's injunction has this sinusoidal current phase relation. So it's also going to end up having a sinusoidal uh, potential energy. Well, okay, near zero, a sine wave looks like a parabola. But away from that, it starts to deviate. And so if you calculate what the energy levels that you get are in this potential, you find that they start getting closer and closer together. They are anharmonic. They are not evenly spaced. Typically, with the device that I'm describing here, which is known as a transmon qubit, uh, this, these levels are weakly anharmonic, about 1 to 10%. So typical energy splittings would be in frequency units on the order of maybe 4 gigahertz. And the anharmonicity, the difference between the, this energy splitting and this energy splitting, would be about maybe 400 megahertz. Now, what's nice here is that it is still pretty weakly anharmonic. So for almost anything you want to do, you can just treat these as if the quantum states are the harmonic oscillator states. You just slightly shift their energies. And that makes it very easy to work with um, anyone who's taken uh, quantum mechanics, especially a Griffiths-based quantum mechanics will know that harmonic oscillators are above, harmonic oscillators are life. They are the easiest thing to work with, and we love them. We can label these states, ground, excited, second excited. We had to skip G because we already used it, third excited. And typically, we'll just take the ground and the first excited states and call them zero and one. And those are our qubit states. Now, of course, this is a, really a qubit. It has way more than two states. But it's good enough. We can just isolate to these two because this energy splitting is different than all the others. So we can drive that independently. And these are great. They're scalable, they're coherent, they're really easy to make, they're really easy to couple to. Can I answer very quickly? Yeah, yeah. So the reason you need like 10 millikelvins is because you want to polarize everything to the ground state, right? 
Yeah, that basically, the, this the this energy splitting in frequency units is only about two hundred milliseconds. Oh, I see. I see. So we need to be way colder than that. I see. So is there a way like you can make this larger, like the splitting larger? So then you you can like yes, make your release your temperature. Part we can we could make the splitting up to about twenty gigahertz without much difficulty. I see. Um, Beyond that, it starts to be kind of difficult because um, you run into the fact that, I mean, this energy splitting is basically determined by the junction inductance and the capacitor capacitance. Um, but the junction is, you know, two pieces of metal separated by an insulator. So it is also a capacitor. And it becomes a self resonant structure at typically 20 to 30 gigahertz. Uh, you also run into the fact that the superconducting gap in these materials, this is aluminum, is only about 80 gigahertz. And so you definitely can't get too close to that. Talk more about that later and why that would cause a problem. All right. It turns out that if you just take one of these things and just hook it up to um, a cable, it's terrible. Absolutely awful. It decays immediately. You can't store any energy in it. You need to isolate it from the environment somehow. And so what we do is actually the same way we can do readout. We take our transmon, any superconducting qubit really, and we couple it to a linear resonator. This could be, again, an LC circuit. It could be like a physical cavity, a set of mirrors. It's just a harmonic oscillator. The cavity now filters the environment. So it protects the qubit from the environment, makes it not decay. But importantly, if these two are resonant with each other, they can exchange energy. But if they're far off resonance, what happens is that the qubit dispersively modifies the cavity resonance. What this means is that the cavity resonant frequency goes to some value plus or minus this shift chi. So it's chi times sigma z, chi times this qubit spin, which is plus or minus one. And so what we can do is send in some light, some microwave frequency probe. And that light will reflect differently, in this case with a different phase shift, depending on whether the qubit is in the ground state or the excited state. Well, that's easy to read out. That's easy to measure, the phase shift on uh, electromagnetic signal. And so that gives us qubit measurement. This can also be used to couple different qubits together. It can be used to store information in a qubit. Uh, you can actually use this whole structure as a single qubit where you're mostly storing the energy in here. Um, just for quantum optics experiments, etc. So this is the basic building block here. This is what we just. That's a question. Yeah. So those first two bullet points are saying very different things. Um, you, you couple it to something, that's fine. You protect it from the environment. That's the opposite of coupling it to something, right? That's decoupling it from things. Yes. So there must be more to just just that you couple it. You've got to also in implementing the second one seems like. Well, so here here's the work. trick. You are, and you are, in fact, quite strongly coupling it to this cavity. But typically, this cavity only has either one mode or a very discrete spectrum of modes. You know, it can only it only has energies at certain frequencies. As long as you keep those away from the qubit frequency, they're not going to exchange energy. What about the rest of its environment? It's all the stuff in the lab. Ah, I mean, so that's the thing. Because this cavity coupling is so strong, and because it's relatively easy in that case to make sure that that's the main thing the transmon sees all of the energy basically all of the electric field goes there um, so physically i mean when you say you couple it to a cavity what does that mean do you like put it inside well uh it so it depends on the type um there's what's known as 3d transmons maybe the easiest to talk about um basically it's this structure with a big antenna on either end so it's like a physical chip that, that they're about a couple of millimeters long. It's a pretty good in size antenna. And you put it inside a box of metal. And that box implements a, a cavity mode, a rectangular cavity usually. And because it's an antenna, it just couples the electric field. In there. It's a dipole coupling. Uh, on the other hand, you could have lumped elements like this. And basically the coherent motion of charge sloshing back and forth in this oscillator, couples to the coherent motion of charge sloshing back and forth here via these capacitances. 
I'll, um, let me take a step back, actually, way back. Um, see if I can show you. Yeah. All right. This right here, this squiggly orange line, that's a resonator. That's a basically a half wavelength alone section of transmission line. Implements basically uh, a, a, a transmission line between two mirrors. And so you can get resonant frequencies between them. This little cross shape thing, I don't know if you can quite see it, it's a little X, is, a is the capacitor of a transmitter. We just bring it close to one end of the resonant and you get a capacitive cost. If you're interested in the sort of underlying quantum mechanical things, this is a charge charge operator here, charge couples to charge. Um, effectively, it looks like qubit sigma x couples to cavity A plus A dagger. You can exchange uh, excitations between the qubit and the cavity when they're on resonance. Does that answer? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So we mentioned challenges. The first one is decoherence. Essentially, it's like I have noise in my system that's either causing state transitions from the ground state to the excited state or back or that's scrambling the phase of superpositions. So we can actually implement this kind of classically in a circuit model by just saying, it looks like there's resistors across these things. Now I'm not gonna talk about this type of resistor caused by dielectric loss, but I am gonna talk about this type of resistor, how you can get lossy transport across a Joseph's injunction. You can also get effective tunability of these elements. That gives you noise in the qubit frequency. That's what scrambles the phase of superpositions. I'm not going to talk about that as much either, because I really just want to focus on one thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's your question. All right. So these decoherences we can sort of decompose into relaxation which is when the excited state goes to the ground state. We also call this a T1 process. It occurs with a characteristic time T1. Um, we can have spurious excitation, which is the opposite, zero goes to one, or dephasing. I'm mostly just going to talk about the causes of these things. And in particular, one cause here that I just want to highlight, superconducting quasi-particles. So I'm going to gloss over most of the rest of this and just say, let's talk about quasi-particles. Because as Cater pointed out, you know, we all just keep doing our thesis first. So I have to get a little bit into the condensed matter. In a superconductor, electrons pair up and they form these uh, composite particles known as Cooper pairs. Cooper pairs are bosons. So they can form a condensate. And they do, they form this Bose Einstein condensate, which is the superconducting condensate. At an energy that we just call zero. We call that the Fermi energy equals zero. And what's interesting, what really creates the superconductivity is the fact that there's an energy gap that forms around this. So to, to energies plus minus delta, there are no states. And then below delta, you have all these occupied states. And then above delta, you have an unoccupied continuum of states. Well, if I take a Cooper pair and I bring in some amount of energy greater than two delta, like let's say I bring in some high energy phonon, that Cooper pair can get broken into two particles that both get promoted up here, up above the gap. These are sort of like normal electrons, but they're dressed by their interactions. So they are called quasi particles. These are quasi quasiparticles, but that's a mouthful, so I'll just say quasiparticles. And what is you know, frustrating about quasiparticles, if you're trying to build a quantum computer, is that they live in a continuum of states. So let me show you how that's a problem. Let's say I have a Joseph's injunction. So I have 
superconductor on one side, I've got some insulator in between. Let's not worry about what happens in there. And I've got superconductor on the other side. And I have these quasi particles living on one side. These quasi particles can tunnel across to the other side, but when they do that, they can do something uh, interesting. If these were Cooper pairs, when they tunnel, there's only one energy they can tunnel to. It's the same as where they came from. They have to tunnel elastically without absorbing or releasing any energy. The quasi particle, when it goes across, can go anywhere up in this continuum. So this one I just drew absorbs some energy. Well, that energy has to come from somewhere. And in this case, it might come from the qubit, from the mode that we are storing our quantum information in. And so that relaxed the qubit and scrambled everything and screwed up our calculation. What, what is the gap? The gap is what you mentioned around like 80 gigahertz? Yeah, so we're doing most of this stuff in aluminum. So it's um, two delta is... 82 gigahertz or 340 microelectron volts um, or about four Kelvin. I see. So that means like literally in, in the system, you have like some background noise microwave that is actually well, more than like two times of this frequency. Let me get into this. Okay. Okay. That's good. So yeah, this, this gap energy in... Sorry, one, one delta is about four, four Kelvin. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. Two delta is about eight Kelvin or so. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, this can cause T1. It can also actually cause um, dephasing, but we won't talk about it. We're doing these experiments at 10 millikelvin. You know, 0 0.015 Kelvin. In fact, sometimes even colder, 0 0.01 sometimes. And this gap energy is from here to here is about eight Kelvin. So you can run through a very simple thermodynamic calculation and you can learn that if you took every uh, quantum information research department in the world and made it out of pure aluminum at that temperature, you might get one quasi particle. So they really shouldn't exist, but they do exist with a fractional density of about 10 to the minus eight. About one in every 10 to the eight Cooper pairs has been broken. This is way, way higher than it should be. You know, this is about 30 orders of magnitude higher than it should be. And when I say that you see this, this is a running list of papers that I stopped updating in 2016 because I got bored of updating it. So I apologize if anyone's paper is not listed here since then. These all saw quasi-particle densities bounded by about this amount. So they're coming from somewhere, some non-equilibrium population. Now there are various things that could be causing it. Uh, maybe some part of your sample gets hot, like the wire bonds that you use to hook up wires to your sample. Maybe they just don't get cold. So maybe that's sitting at like, you know, one Kelvin generating quasi-particles. We know that black body radiation at least used to be a problem. You're Sample sitting inside a cryostat, but there's parts of the cryostat that are much warmer than 10 millikelvin. Those can emit infrared photons, which can hit your sample and break pairs. So now we put everything inside these radiation shields, which, as you can see, are very black on the inside and very shiny on the outside. These are fun to make, basically finger painting with really, really disgusting black stuff. <laughs> um, on the other hand, maybe you can't really shield it. Maybe you've got some high energy penetrating radiation, like gamma rays, that's just going to come in and dump a ton of energy into your device. Maybe there's materials defects. Maybe the gap isn't really 8 Kelvin. Maybe it's actually like, you know, 500 millikelvin. Well, then we'd expect some blood particles. We don't know. We need to study this. Excuse me. Yeah. This 10 to the power minus 8 is only for aluminum, right? This is, yeah, aluminum at low temperature. So why not use the material with a much higher PC or delta. Ah, so uh, a couple of reasons. First, we do for parts of these. Um, it seems to help a little bit, but not that much. And I'll get into why. Um, but second, it turns out that basically only aluminum and nothing but aluminum makes really nice Joseph's injunctions. And everything else is terrible. Um, <laughs> People have spent like decades trying to make better junctions out of other materials. Is it because of its 
metal oxide a little. Yeah, it, it na it's native thermally grown oxide. It's just like cleaner than anything else we can do. Um, and it turns out that it really only matters that much what the junction is doing. It doesn't really care so much what everything else is doing. Um, but it's a good question and we are working on it. And it should help a little bit. It shouldn't make it worse, but it doesn't seem to help very much. So anyway, we need to understand the behavior better. So let me talk about how we're doing this in my lab. Um, I'm going to actually skip over this a little bit. Basically, different behavior will give you is there different generation or annihilation mechanisms, for instance, different sources of these quasi particles, different ways they, they destroy themselves, will give you different behavior. For instance, if you have you know, quasi particles because your thing just happens to be a little hot, you'll generate quasi particles very near the gap edge. On the other hand, if you have a gamma ray coming in, it's going to generate super high energy quasi particles, which can then emit phonons and generate more quasi particles. So you'll get bursts. That's why maybe it wouldn't help to use a high gap material because nothing's going to have a higher gap than a gamma ray. Basically, what we want to do is reduce the generation of these things, enhance the annihilation, we want them to recombine into group pairs and keep them away from sensitive elements, but we need a test bed for testing these things. So we're gonna use what we call trapping measurements. So the idea is this. So I'm wrong here schematically. Just, yeah, so like, so are you going to talk about how do you detect different magnets? Is, is that right, what you're going to talk about? Let me, okay. let me get it. <laughs> so what I'm drawing here schematically is the superconducting gap as a function of position. This is position across a device. Let's say I've got a quasi particle up in the continuum of states. It's above the gap energy. It can't drop any lower. There's no allowed states down there. But let's say it comes to some place where there is an allowed state. Well, then it's energetically favorable for it to fall in. And as long as that trap is deep compared to the temperature, then it's going to get stuck. It's not going to come out. So if we make a circuit that's somehow sensitive to the presence of a quasi particle in a trap, then we can detect. Now we, we want some ideal characteristics here. We want to be able to tune the energy of this trap, how deep it is. We'd like to be able to reset it, so clear a quasi particle out. We'd like to be able to measure multiple quasi particles. We don't want it to saturate when one of them traps. And we'd like both the resolution to see whether there's zero or one or two or three the S and R to do this quickly in a single shot, and what we call QND, quantum non-demolition detection. I would like to be able to detect whether there's a quasi particle there without like clearing it out or anything. I want to leave it there. I want to do all this fast and with high S and R so we can measure the dynamics. So our tool for this are what we call Andrea states. Now, in the interest of time, because I think we, do we have a hard stop at five. Um, yeah, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of this. And I'm just going to say, you can make a funky junction that you only make if um, you hate yourself. Uh, and it will produce these sub gap trap states where the trap depth will depend on the phase bias of the junction. That funky junction. Oops, what's called an aluminum nanobridge junction. Originally um, made for a very different application and we discovered that they were really good at trapping quasi particles. Um, basically, you take two superconducting contacts and you connect them with a very thin narrow bridge. And this acts like a dosis injunction. Um, in particular, it has a lot of trap states inside it. And it's completely compatible with our ordinary qubit fabrication. So we can make devices with this that look a lot like superconducting qubits. And so they should have similar quasi-particle behavior. The device we made here is a nanosquid resonator. What you're seeing here is a section of transmission line that is a quarter wavelength long and dead ends in a squid with two nanobridge junctions in it. You can just barely see a junction there and a junction there. And I'm basically drawing what the current does 
in this resin here. The current oscillates where here there's zero current is connected DC. And then at this place, the current is maximized and it oscillates. This is a quarter wavelength resonant mode. This device is resonant about 4.3 gigahertz. The resonant frequency will tune with flux through the squid, but it'll also change with the number of quasi particles trapped in the junctions. Trapping a quasi particle is going to change the inductance of these junctions, and so it's going to shift the resonant frequency. So by reading out the resonant frequency, we can measure the quasi particle number. Now, if you want to actually do that, you need this, which is an extremely simplified version of our setup. So, you know, that took a while. Um, but what we end up with is what we see here. We basically expect that as we flux bias the squid, when we get the flux bias beyond about maybe 0.3 of a flux quantum, we should see quasi-particle traffic. So what I'm plotting here is basically the response of the resonator as a function of drive frequency and as a function of flux. And let me just ghost out what's happening in the background. Look at high flux here. We see this sort of like multi-peak behavior. What this is, is the resonant response with zero, one, and two trapped quasi particles sort of averaged together. This is a very long time average measurement. This is sort of like, it's in zero most of the time, but sometimes it's in one, sometimes it's in Q, and we just sort of average it all together. This is from 2014, or actually this data was in 2013. So this is old. Let me show you what's new. And, sorry, can I just like, yeah. but in this case, you're doing each experiment, like you're average across, but you're doing each experiment, like, I don't know, with the time space in between them so that you reset all the quasi particles back to. Well, like, it's not that we reset, it's that every single point here that you see takes several seconds. I see. And the quasi particle dynamics are more on the scale of like milliseconds. Okay, so that's, that's the time scale. Thank you. This is 100% average. This is like the probability distribution, basically. Okay. Let's do it continuously. So let's say instead of sweeping the drive frequency, we sit at exactly one drive frequency. Well, then the response of the resonator should have these sort of like real and imaginary components here that are determined by the detuning of the drive frequency from the resonant frequency. So as the resonant frequency moves, that should shift. In particular, if we have a resonance which is moving as a function of quasi-particle number, as we've shown here, the response is going to move up and down this sort of uh, turquoise line here. So if we can do this with high SNR, we should see that the response jumps around. So, so it's jumping around because the number of trapped quasi particles is changing. Which is in a discrete way. It's jumping. Yes, it, it has to, it, you can't have half a trapped quasi particle. So it's got to be on one of these curves. And you know, if you just sort of look at the bottom here, you can see that the curves land on different discrete places here. So the curves, so at any given moment, one of these curves is sort of the real curve. Yes. So from moment to moment, it's randomly lighting up different curves. And that means the intersection with your vertical line is jumping around. Exactly. Is that, yeah. Exactly. Okay. If I was better at animations, I would animate it. <laughs> it turns out the nicest way to look at this, to sort of see what's going on, is just to histogram the response. So we're just going to like measure the response as a function of time over some long time, and then just make a histogram of what comes out. Shown here is what happens when we expect no trapping. So there's no bias on the squid, no flux bias. There shouldn't be any quasi particles trapped. And this is basically the real and imaginary parts of the reflected signal uh, histogram. And we just get a single Gaussian distribution. So it just looks like any other resonator. This is exactly what we expect. You know, it's some, got some mean value and some noise around it. But when we go to a finite flux, if I look at the time series of the response, this is sort of, again, real and imaginary parts of the reflection coefficient as a function of time, I see these discrete jumps. This is manifestly not Gaussian noise. And it's really obvious if I histogram this, I get something that looks like this. So you can kind of see, I've got like a big distribution here, but then I've got like, some smearing, and then another one here, and then another one here. 
And in fact, what I can see is that these other distributions start to appear as I increase the trap depth, as I increase the flux bias, the probability of trapping. At low flux bias, you know, 0.34 of a flux quantum, I pretty much see just one distribution. Slightly higher, I'm starting to see a little bit of a tail here. Slightly higher, and now I definitely see a tail. And in fact, I kind of see a, a well-defined distribution here, and maybe even another one here. Even further flux bias, I definitely see three. It's a little difficult to tell that these are three distinct ones because this is a log scale. But if you sort of zoom in, you can definitely tell that there's one here, one here, and one here. And in fact, we can even go beyond that. Um, it turns out that basically in this particular device, uh, trapping two quasi-particles shifted the device resonance more than a line width of resonance. So I'm probing at one frequency, the response basically saturates some fully off resonance. Well, what I can do is I can sort of saturate in the other direction. I can probe so far below the resonance that zero and one quasi-particle responses look pretty similar. And then I'm actually able to pick up three quasi-particles trapping. So let me show you that. What I'm doing here, this is sort of normally what I get when I probe sort of between zero and one quasi-particle resonant frequencies. As I decrease the resonant frequency, these two are going to get close together. This is two, it's going to separate. And then I start to get this other mode. You see these get squished together. And as I probe sort of right at the two quasi-particle frequency, I can barely see the difference between zero and one, but now I can really see there's another mode out here, three quasi-particles trapping. The fact that these are well separated means I have single shot SNR means I'm measuring them one at a time as a function of time continuously. Now, because we're running short on time, I'm going to skip over the details of exactly how we do the analysis, which is um, a whole heck of a lot of work that we put in before um, we realized that there's such a thing as a hidden Markov model, and now we need to go do that. So this is like a slightly worse version of something that people have done for years. Um, I'm going to jump to what we've learned. This is still early days in the actual measurements of the behavior of the quasi-particles. So take all of this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but we're really showing that the detector does work. What we're showing is that if you're into quasi-particles, this is a histogram, sorry, if, if you have um, zero trapped quasi-particles, this is a histogram of the lifetime in that mode. In other words, how long does it spend with zero quasi-particles? And how many times does it spend at least that long? Let me histogram. And it turns out these follow pretty much an exponential distribution, which is what you expect for Poisson statistics. In other words, Every untrapping event, every uh, sorry, every trapping event, every time that you stop having zero quasi particles and start having one, seems kind of independent of every other one, at least in this model. And typically, it's about um, eight hundred thirty or so uh, microseconds. Actually, I believe. This is the wrong number. There's some calibration we have to do for the fact that the detector is finite bandwidth. It's more like 700 microseconds. Our detector works on the scale of like a microsecond. So we can definitely detect the times between trapping events. We can also look at specific transitions. We can say like, okay, sometimes it jumps from having two quasi-particles directly to zero. Well, when it does that, What's the histogram of lifetimes? And I get something like this. Again, at long times, you see this exponential behavior indicating some sort of Poisson statistics. At low times, you actually see it falls off. That's due to the bandwidth of the detector. Um, but we make all those corrections. Uh, the number ends up being about three microseconds. So we're sort of more in the fast limit here. It's a little harder to detect. But we have the ability to sort of look at these things conditional on whatever transition we want. You know, if you ask me, how often does it go from zero to two to one to two to zero? I can tell you, and I can tell you the average time scale for doing it. 
So we're now we're digging into these things and just basically looking for things that are not trivial Poisson statistics, looking for correlations. Um, if we wanted the rates for the three positive particle transitions, we'd need slightly better SNR, and we have paths to get there. We're just sort of doing it in the next device. I'm gonna skip this. So there's one big source of these things that I've um, glossed over. You know, we've talked about going to high gap and fixing materials defects and you know, gamma rays are gamma rays, but maybe you can make your lab completely free of all radioactivity. But you're probably not going to get rid of cosmic rays. There are supernovae out there that are sending protons at very close to the speed of light into the outer atmosphere, which are colliding with things and sending muons, which come down and hit your device. And they're dumping many mega electron volts of energy into your device. There's no way you're going to make a superconductor with a gap higher than that. So are you screwed? Do you need to put your quantum computer deep in a mine shaft? Don't laugh. They've already tried it. <laughs> Group of, the, I forget what the laboratory is called, but there's a lab in Italy that is inside a mountain. Grand Grand Sessa, yeah. Uh, and they did a uh, measurement with a quasi-particle detector in there. And they saw, oh, there's way fewer background quasi-particles in our device. No one's actually put a qubit in there yet, but I'd be interested to see what happens. So when you have these cosmic rays hit a device, they should cause this giant burst of quasi-particles, tons of quasi-particles all at once. And this is especially bad because if I have many qubits on a chip, this big burst of quasi-particles will cause them all to start flipping states, all to start having errors. And it turns out that all of our best ideas for getting around errors in a quantum computation involve encoding information in multiple qubits which have independent errors. We rely on the errors being independent for what's called error correction. So if those errors are no longer independent, we are in a lot of trouble. This is not hypothetical. The Google group has seen this and has published on it. Um, the McDermott group at the University of Wisconsin has seen it. They have not yet published on it, but they showed some data. So what are we going to do? Well, here's an interesting thing. We don't see it. In our simulations, if you plot the sort of like mean number of quasi-particles that are trapped as a function of time and then histogram the results. You should see basically, you know, a Poissonian distribution and then another lump out at higher occupation, which is the result of these bursts. When we do this in experiment, we just see a single exponential decay. We don't see any evidence of bursts, even though our mean occupation here um, the, the uh, axis is a little misleading. This is about like 0 0.02. And up here it's one. So these other groups that see it, do they, do they see a pattern like this? Well, so they're doing completely different measurement because they're, they're measuring basically qubit errors. Okay. Um, so they, they do see distributions like this as sort of like error rates of qubits. So you ask if they can see some Burstiness associated. They, they with absolutely the see burstiness. They, they have temporal resolution and they see like everything's quiet, everything's quiet, everything's quiet. Yeah. And then one qubit starts being really terrible. And then all the nearby ones start being really ter terrible slightly thereafter. And then all the nearby ones after that, they actually see it diffuse. Okay. And then you don't see that down a mine shaft and you would say, okay. It's well, no one's actually tried that down a mine shaft, but they should. Or probably more easily, they should just fly it up to NIST in Boulder and see that it gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're saying you don't see burstiness in your experiment. See. You see, you see no. a uniform uh, exponential interval, which you expect from a steady process with way too high of a rate to be muons, which are one per <laughs> one per square centimeter per minute. Okay, exactly. at sea level, so they're not muons. Exactly. I mean, we definitely have other sources other than muons, but we would expect muons to be giving us big bursts and we don't see it. Now, there's 
interesting explanations and uninteresting explanations. You know, maybe our SNR which just wasn't quite high enough, and actually we wouldn't expect that many more trapped quasi particles. So we need really fine resolution to detect. Uh, maybe we just, um, maybe honestly, we actually did see it, but when you trap a lot of quasi particles in our detector, it looks exactly like trapping zero um, if you probe at the right frequency. Uh, so we might have just gotten unlucky. We may have even just literally missed muons. We didn't look for that much longer than we would expect. We would have expected maybe 10 to 20 events. You can get unlucky and not have 10 to 20 events. You can not have, if you can have zero events. But on the other hand, maybe there's something systemic here going on. This nanobridge is a constriction. It's a region where whatever is going through it has to be close to everything else that's going through it. So if quasi particles are coming in and you have more than one of them, they have to get close to each other. When they get close to each other, they're probably more likely to recombine into a Cooper pair. So it may be that it's actually really hard for quasi particles to get through a junction. Now we have seen higher trap occupations in the past. We've definitely seen more than this, but it may be that it's easy to get like two or three quasi particles in there, but really hard to get 20 of them. And when there's 20 coming in from a burst, they all just immediately annihilate. We're going to test this because if this works, this is a great way to keep quasi particles away from sensitive things in your qubit. You just make a little constriction. So we're going to check it. So where we are right now, we basically have a new device finally, which is sort of optimized for everything. It's got a little bit broader bandwidth, so we can see up to six quasi particles before it starts to saturate. Um, we're working on our analysis and in particular correcting for the um, finite bandwidth of the detector and managing to look at things that are happening sort of faster than the detector bandwidth. Um, there's some fancy statistics you could do with that, which I'm happy to talk about later if anyone's interested. We're gonna start doing spectroscopic measurements of these trapped quasi particles. You know, they're in an energy state and we can clear them out if we give them enough energy to jump up to the continuum. Well, we can measure how much energy that is just by hitting them with various different amounts and seeing how they respond. And then finally, we're just going to check all of these different mitigation techniques. Um, those of you who are interested in superconducting qubits will be familiar with all of these. Um, it turns out like what type of cable you use probably matters. Whether the cable has like a braided outer shield or a solid outer shield seems to matter. Um, you know, if you've made your black paint appropriately lumpy inside your um, radiation shield actually seems to matter. So we're going to work on all these things. In the so what's interesting to me about all this is that we've gone from sort of quantum computing, the, the, the most, you know, quantum information -y application here. And in order to make it work, we need to do some fairly hardcore condensed matter physics. Even though everything about the computation is just the Schrodinger equation, everything about uh, how these devices work is just sort of straightforward microwave engineering. In order to actually make them work well, we still got to understand Andrei states. We still have to understand quasi particles. And so this is really cool to me about this field is that you can sort of find use for whatever knowledge you have, because there's always going to be a problem that uses it. So anyway, thank you for your attention. This has been great. Um, I'll take whatever questions you have for as long as you have them, but otherwise I guess we're out of time. an anti-coincidence shield to tell when you're getting a muon through your apparatus. You absolutely could. And by the time you have time to anything do, to do anything about it, that muon has already gone through your... Uh, well, certainly, but you could actually, in principle, for 100 years, for a couple of practice.
But couldn't you then test the hypothesis that the muons are the source of this by seeing you get your opposites when there's a signal lamp? Yes. Um, and people have, in fact, already done this. A group at MIT Lincoln Lab has done this. And they did see a correlation between what looked like quasi-particles. They didn't have as, as sensitive of measurement as we did, but they saw what looked like quasi-particles correlating with scintillator detectors, scintillation detectors going off. Um, it doesn't seem like it is the primary source of quasi particles. It seems like a good chunk of that is still like gamma rays from radiation in your lab. Um, and another good chunk is sort of unexplained. Um, but muons definitely contribute and they contribute the largest bursts. But unfortunately, knowing that it's there doesn't do much for us because we can't really outrun the muon. You know, it's very fast, even if we slow it down a little bit with some shielding. Um, and uh, we can't like stop a calculation in the middle and just freeze everything, save it. There's no such thing as saving quantum information. We can transfer it with quantum teleportation, but that's very slow. We can't copy it and we can't you know, store it classically. So we need a way around it. Jim? Yeah. Uh -huh. I yeah, think, I, I think. I think oh, sorry. sorry. Did somebody say Jim? <laughs> yeah. I uh, so the, I think the biggest mystery of this is the exponential uh, distribution. This implies uh, a Poisson process, and it doesn't imply any burstiness. Like I could see a muon, a muons, gammas, they're going to go through once in a blue moon for something this size on this time scale, whatever it is now radioactivity in your instrument. It's just not, it's, so the only way they could do something is like to heat things up and then, you know, you wait for things to thermalize and they bubble off. But how do you get this, this exponential distribution without being in a bath of completely unrelated, you know, rare low energy events? Yeah. So we absolutely have those. We absolutely have unrelated rare low energy. Yeah, that doesn't somehow. make sense. <laughs> and we think it's probably still these infrared black body photons, these um, you know higher temperature oh. things in the fridge somehow radiating. Oh, our oh, 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 okay, okay. Um, but we are not sure because we've really filtered the ever loving crap out of them. Right. Um, you know, it, I, it is extraordinarily difficult for an infrared photon to make its way to our device. We really thought we would have gotten rid of all of them. But that's what some you need. It, yeah. yeah, some of it may actually be um, a self-limiting process where when the quasi-particle density gets very, very low, if you only have a few of them, they're going to live a really long time as they travel around because they have to find a partner in order to recombine. Um, and when they're created, they tend to fly off in opposite directions. So. It may be that really what we're looking at here of this exponential is just one quasi-particle jumping in and out many, many, many times. Do you see any other conditions in your lab? Any turning lights on and off, uh, cooling down, <laughs> changing uh, the temperature of the fridge, anything else changing the, the delta T, the average delta T between events or? So fridge temperature, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Up, okay. Absolutely. As you fridge the, heat the fridge up, two two things happen. One is that trapping itself becomes less likely because the traps, you know, are sort of a thermal process, and you have more mm. thermal energy to make sure they get out. Oh. Um, okay. But the second is that you thermally generate quasi particles. You know, the the if mm -hmm. you assign the density that the quasi particles that we see to a temperature, yeah. it's equivalent to maybe like seventy or eighty millikelvin. So oh, I thought you. Okay. You just generate more than that. I thought um, you said it had to be more like higher than that. I, you were saying at ten millikelvin, you never expected or something, but seventy right, millikelvin, right. you could thermally generate them. Because it's an exponential suppression. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so at seventy, you would get enough. Okay. Maybe nine. I don't know. I, I need to. I need to run through the math again. It's definitely less than a hundred. Um, oh, so maybe you're not thermalizing your bridge or something. Or... <laughs> Maybe. But <laughs> Sorry, this is fascinating. I got to shut up. Yeah. This is fascinating. <laughs> this is something we're going to look at. We're looking at correlations. So if it really does seem always Poisson, then it implies a thermal process. However, everything else seems to be a lot colder than this. So it's be interesting to see that this isn't cold. 
we do see that um, our filtering and our shielding matters. You know, if I uh, run my microwave cables through a lossy filter that it kills infrared, then I get a lower quasi-particle density compared to if I remove that filter. Um, if I take this black radiation shield, and actually there's like three layers of them, and I just slightly crack one of the layers, it gets worse. So I definitely noticed that it matters. Um, there was a group, I believe, that took one of their devices and like took the actual box that they had their device in and potted the whole thing in like black uh, epoxy that was absorbing all the infrared. They still saw quasi particles. Maybe they were coming down the cave. We don't know. You mean, um, this might have milli EV uh, dark photons converting into photons in your detector. Yeah, so you um, have to don't give up on chasing all these things. You should talk to the ADMX people. <laughs> This. you know maybe the axion is a little bit higher energy than they thought yeah we are admx people what <laughs> some of us um okay yeah, i didn't understand one thing when you're talk talking about trapping of this quasi particles how do you get a fraction of a flux quantum flux ah so sorry it, you're correct that the actual flux threading loop will always be some number of flux quanta the applied flux is going to be fractional. And what that does is it sets up a circulating current that either cancels it out or jumps it up to the next flux quantum. And it's the magnitude of that circulating current that actually gives you the phase bias. Um, it, what's nice is it's super easy to calibrate how much your applied flux is because everything it does, every effect that you see will be periodic in a flux quantum. If you just ramp the applied flux, you see some periodicity, and you say, okay, that periodicity is exactly one flux quantum of applied flux. But yeah, the actual total flux threading move is always a flux quantum or some, some integer number. And you also talked about the possibility of two quasi particles becoming a pair. Yes. So when it happens, it should emit a uh, microwave, right? Well, it should uh, emit something at you know at least 80 gigahertz um you should be able to probably a phonon probably not a photon it seems like the phonon matrix element is much larger um and in fact that phonon can then go off and break another pair um and this is really annoying because it turns out that if i have a piece of metal over here and a piece of metal over here and they're connected only by a substrate there's no dc connection between them they're not there's no way for superconducting quasi particles to transport between them. You, they can still diffuse between by recombining, emitting a, photon, a phonon to the substrate. The phonon travels through the substrate, comes back up, and breaks another pair. And this has been observed. Um, and it's just one of the, you know, the universe being out to get you type of situations where these things are harder than they should be. Yeah, so for this quasi particles, like if they introduce, for example, like a defacing or something, mm -hmm. incoherence, I don't know, like if their if their correlation time or lifetime is so long, can you do something like a periodic driving and then just cancel that out? Like you just keep periodically flipping your qubit or something, and then you can actually decouple that out. Yeah. Um, so what you're describing basically is dynamical decoupling. Yeah. Um, for Dephasing, it's a little easier because it turns out when the when the quasi particles uh, cause dephasing, what they're doing is they're causing sort of quasi static changes in the qubit frequency. Um, and as long as it's constant over the course of your operation, or yeah, if um, the correlation time is longer than that, that's also fine. Yeah, longer than the yeah the spacing between your pulses. Yeah, then yeah. you can echo it out. Uh, you can you can cancel it with dynamical decoupling. Um, Relaxation seems to not work that way. Yes. Because it seems like basically, you know, your qubit gives energy to your quasi particle, which then flies away immediately and never comes back. Yeah, that only um, works for dephasing, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And it the, the dephasing is sort of a less strong effect and easier to get rid of. The relaxation is more of an issue. And in fact, the spurious excitation is an even larger issue. Um, it doesn't happen as often, 
But some of these quasi particles are hot. They've got extra energy and they can give it to a qubit and kick it from the ground state up to the excited state. There's a lot of um, error correction algorithms that rely on that process not happening. And so those would really be killed by this. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, no further questions. Thank you, Lenny, again. Yeah.